So I'm going to try inflicting on you a logic talk, uh, which is, you know, what I'd be doing today if we had a logic seminar and I was scheduled. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of work that I've been doing lately uh, for a fresh riff for Alistair O'Cart uh, on uh, models for relevant logic. And some of you are people who've thought about this a lot, and some of you who have, uh, you know, joined us don't know much about this, but hopefully it'll give you a bit of an idea of the kind of stuff that I work on. So, um, this is going to be uh, a talk about some of the connections between geometries and models for relevant logic, uh, written, as I said, for a fetch for Alistair, and I'm trying out this Zoom stuff. So, um, how many of us were at this meeting? This is Banff in 2007. Um, I think if you uh, look closely, that's Graham Priest over there in the back corner uh, with me. And Alistair, who this talk is about, is right there smiling at the front. And um, other people that you might know, you can recognize there's Tim Williamson, there's Jill Russell, uh, there's Kate Mann, there's Audrey App. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people uh, in this meeting uh, in Banff, which I think of as just recently, but if you do the arithmetic, it is 13 years ago, uh, which is a while. But this was a, this was a fun meeting that uh, Richard Zach uh, and uh, others organized to get together a, a heck of a lot of people working in philosophical logic uh, in the mountains and the snow. Um, but Alistair, who I'm going to be talking about, is there, and another person who wasn't there at that time uh, was Bob Meyer, uh, who has also done a lot of work in relevant logic, who I was closer to than, than Alistair. And there's a nice photo of them uh, just before Bob passed away. So um, one reason that Alistair is really significant is I think he's written, you know, three papers which would be in anybody's top 10 papers of work in relevant logic. And he, uh, you know, did this, there's this very significant paper on the semantics of relevant logics from 1972, which introduced the binary operational semantics for relevant logic, which I'll, I'll explain soon. But then the next decade proved the undecidability of entailment and relevant logics. That's in 1984. And then the decade after that, uh, the failure of interpolations for relevant logics. One positive paper and two fairly negative papers, uh, both refuting conjectures or hopes that people had had. Uh, but these two, sec this second and third paper there, the undecidability paper and the failure of interpolation paper, are uh, really significant, not only because they prove really uh, quite significant and tricky theorems to prove, uh, but he did this by introducing concepts from geometry and applied these to uh, uh, open questions in uh, in relevant logics. In the uh, undecidability paper, he proved that the implication conjunction disjunction fragment of uh, the relevant systems R and E and others are undecidable. But he did this by using techniques from uh, modular lattices, which are proved by uh, embedding or by showing that you can use techniques from geometry inside the models of relevant logics. And he did the same thing uh, here in this paper. He was using facts from projective geometry and applying these uh, through the connections between projective geometries and other geometries and models for relevant logics. So I'm hoping to explain some of that. And here's the, here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to introduce Urquhart's results in models for relevant logic. Then I'm going to talk about some uh, joint work that I've been doing with Sean that is going to be applicable here, um, things on collection frames for, for relevant logics. Then we'll look at two different things, uh, the idea of a pointed infinity and uh, then a result about functional geometric set frames. So that's the outline. How does that sound? Following so far, not cutting out, Great. Excellent. First thing, models for relevant logics. So back to this first paper. Uh, as many of you know, 
a relevant logic being the notion of implication. Uh, here, we've got the implication uh, statement, if A, then B. And what makes a logic relevant is that for if A, then B to be true, uh, there needs to be some kind of connection between the A and the B. The A needs to be relevant to the B in some way or other. And this is a straightforward idea. Lots of people think that if a statement, if A then B is gonna be true, there's gotta be some connection between the A and the B. Now, a lot of work in 20th century logic has been thinking about how we can understand when it is that a statement is true in terms of the different situations in which it's true. And the technology of you know, possible world semantics is being used for this. And if we use that kind of technique to understand when a conditional if A then B is true, a natural thought would be that a conditional is true at a world if at some appropriately chosen worlds, call them Y, if the antecedent A is true at that world, then the consequent is going to be true at that world too. That's a very natural thought. So let me see if I can draw on this. So the conditional if A then B is going to be true over here at this world X. If in some way we choose a bunch of other worlds somehow related to where we started, maybe just related on the basis of the X or maybe the antecedent of the conditional uh, is the part of the basis of the choice of these worlds. Doesn't really matter how you do it. You look at all of these worlds, select from among them the places where A was true, and then you ask the question of them, is B true there? So this works for strict implication. Uh, this works for counterfactual semantics of counterfactual conditionals. Lots of work in the 20th century has been giving a semantics like that for conditionals. And this just doesn't work for relevant logics. Uh, doesn't work because a canonical example of a conditional which is irrelevant is this one. Uh, if P then, if Q then Q. So here, uh, the antecedent and the consequent don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. The antecedent P uh, is just this arbitrary statement and if Q then Q is another statement and P and Q might have nothing to do with each other. So if I use a, an, a way of evaluating anything like this, it's not going to get that right. Uh, and here's why. If I look at a world and ask is if Q then Q there, true there, then if I use that technique of having a bunch of things that I'm selecting relative to where we started, asking of those worlds, is Q true in those worlds? And then checking, or sorry, selecting some and saying, these are the Q worlds. And then asking, well, is Q true there? The answer is always going to be yes. And so what that means is if Q then Q is going to be true absolutely anywhere. So then if I'm asking the question, if P then if Q then Q, is that true over here? Whatever world I select to ask the question, if Q then Q is always going to give me the answer. Yes. So we're always going to get the answer. Yes. To this. So this uh, statement, if P then if Q then Q is always going to turn out to be true. We could never find a world where it isn't true. So uh, there's that kind of semantics is always going to uh, validate this claim and not going to give us a counterexample to it. So it's no good for trying to understand how a conditional could be relevant. So Alistair's insight was you don't do that. You don't use that technique. You check the antecedent A and the consequent B at different places. Uh, you don't check them at the same place. This way you can break the connection between the antecedent Q and the consequent Q, which if you think about it for a moment, uh, the idea of a relevant connection means there's got to be a kind of intimate connection between the antecedent and the consequent. And it does seem a little bit weird to say we're going to check them at different places uh, to, to break this conditional. But there's, there's a reason for it. So when you do Alistair's insight for how to do this is to say that a conditional is true at a point or at a world, if and only if for each world where the antecedent is true, then when you combine those two things together, you get the consequent true there. And this is going to be enough to uh, make this thing no longer a problem. Uh, it's very easy to see how. Uh, I ask here if, if P then if Q then Q is going to be true at this world. I check and look at 
some and uh, some world where the antecedent is true sorry p and then i ask um if i apply this world x to the world y i'm going to get this other world uh, which is x combined with y and i ask is q implies q going to be true there well i don't know but we can ask is q implies q going to be true there we do the same thing we look at an antecedent world here call this z is q true here and what Oh, if Q is true there, is Q true at this world, uh, X, oh, X combined with Y combined with Z, and we ask, is Q true there? And now the fact that Q is true at this one is no guarantee that the Q is going to be true at that one. Uh, at least there's no guarantee that Q is going to be true. They're, they're different places. Yes, if a combination of these things is cumulative in the sense that if something is true at x, then it's also true at x combined with y. If you just think of that as adding more and more information, then yeah, if q is true at z, it's going to be true at this other world combined with z. But if it isn't cumulative, if you think that adding, um, combining bits of information together can give you something else and can take away the information that you have, then this is no longer a problem. You can refute it. And so that's the kind of models that Alistair looks at. Now, you might notice in the uh, explanation that I was giving, I shifted from talking about worlds to talking about points or, or something else, uh, because they're not really worlds. Uh, if you think of a world as a total, complete state description for how things are, then you don't really combine this with another one in any meaningful kind of way, or at least that doesn't seem to seem to make much sense. Uh, Alistair calls them pieces of information and because it's really quite clear how you can combine pieces of information, I'm just going to call them points, partly because that's just an abstract, this could be applied in any different kind of way, but also partly because I'm going to be thinking about these things in geometric senses In I'm going to think of these as combined inside a space and, and that's a very natural thing to call them. Now for Urquhart, the notion of combination here is commutative. If I combine X with Y, it's the same thing as combining Y with X. It's associative, X combined with Y combined with Z, same in any order. And it's idempotent. X combined with X is the same as just X by itself. Now, the fact that we can use this thing to make an identity statement file somewhere doesn't mean that an identity statement is true nowhere. Okay. Uh, if, for example, we have a point which, uh, which Alistair calls zero, where zero combined with a point gives you that point back, then this point zero will make true absolutely every identity statement. So an identity statement is going to be true at this special point, which has got this feature that if you combine it with something, you only get that, that thing back. And so one way of thinking about the zero point is it just contains the kind of logical truths or the, the principles of inference, which extract, which just make explicit what was already implicit in a piece of information or something like that. It doesn't give you any new information. It gives you the information that was already there. And if you've got a point like that, then indeed the identity statements are going to be true. So that's the kind of stuff that, that Alistair was doing. Now, uh, later in the later literature, we call this a kind of normal point because the, the truths of logic get to be true there. Now, there's a lovely semantics for relevant implication. Gorgeous. A lot of you know it. However, it doesn't work for giving models for the kinds of logics that Alistair was interested in, at least when it comes to conjunction, disjunction, uh, conditional, and other stuff. In particular, disjunction is the fly in the ointment. Natural thought about uh, points and dis disjunction is you might think that a disjunction is true at a point just when one of the disjuncts is true at that point. If you do that, this is going to overgenerate. It's going to make more things true at points than, than we'd like. Uh, and there's an intu intuitive way of understanding how this might be. If I've got a point uh, which makes true a conditional like this, you know, if P, then Q or R. And I've got another point where P is true then combine the two points together, I'm going to get Q or R true, but there's absolutely no guarantee that, I'm, that 
that it should be cute or that it should should be R. And uh, in classical logic, for example, uh, there's no problem because P implies Q or R will uh, entail P implies Q uh, or P implies R. And so a point which makes P implies Q or R true is going to either make P implies Q true or P implies R true. And so you just check which one of those is true at the point and then select whichever consequent you want at Q or R. But this is not valid in relevant logic. This, is, this inference is not valid even in intuitionist logic. Uh, the idea of um, if you made your points determinate enough to choose one disjunct over another, then uh, it seems to overgenerate in this case because there's nothing in settling this disjunct in the cons disjunction in the consequent of a conditional to mean that I have to choose which of the uh, disjuncts in that consequent are being implied by P. So the idea uh, is dealt with in this paper, which was written independently uh, to Alistair's semantics of entitlement paper. Uh, this, this paper on the semantics of entitlement by uh, Bob Meyer and Richard Routley uh, uses very similar ideas to the, the Urquhart style, um, the Urquhart style operational semantics, but it's slightly different. Uh, so here's, here's Bob to remind you of uh, the connection between Bob and Alistair. The, the fix to that problem in the ternary relational semantics is to generalize, to say that instead of thinking of uh, combination as an operation between points, where we've just got this one point Z, which is given by combining X and Y, instead we think of Z as a possible result of combining X and Y. So if you combine X and Y and the result has got to have a disjunction true, well, one way of choosing the result will choose one disjunct, another way of choosing a result will choose the other disjunct, etc. And so there might be more than one way of combining X and Y. There might be more than one result or because this is a relation, there might be none. There might be no way of combining X and Y uh, in a point. And so you generalize the, the truth conditions for the conditional in this way, uh, so that instead of uh, a conditional being true at a point just when find where the antecedent is true combine that with the uh place where the conditional is true and check the consequent now we say for any y and z which if the antecedent is true at y and z is a possible result of combining with x and y combining x and y then uh the consequent is true at that z for however many of those z's there are so and then you can have the standard clauses for conjunction, for disjunction, all works, it's all lovely. But there's a cost for this. Uh, it's the twofold cost, uh, two versions of complexity. The result in this semantics that Meyer and Routley gave for relevant logics uh, is now not just a set of points and an operation on that uh, set of points of combining things. That's, that's pretty elegant. Now we've got a set of points, there are world-like things. Now we've got the normal points. The very natural thing to do in these semantics is not to say that there's one normal point zero, but uh, a whole class of them. Uh, we've got this three-place relation, which is more complicated than a binary operation. And in general, we've got this partial order on points too. And it's a pretty complex beast. Uh, it's complex because it's not just an arbitrary set of points, subset, binary relation and ternary relation. It is those things, but there's a bunch of conditions. Uh, we need n to be non-empty. We need this to be a partial order or a pre-order. And we need r to connect to the partial order in the right kind of way. And we need uh, there to be a connection between the partial order and the set of normal points. There's ways of simplifying this a little bit, but the kinds of models that you get are complicated. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, to model nice logics like R, like the, the logic that, that Alistair and Bob were especially concerned about in these uh, early works, as well, you need complicated conditions on the, the ternary relation as well, which sort of generalize associativity, commutativity, and item potency. But that's not the kind of complexity that, that I'm most worried about. That's a bit, bit of the kind of complexity. The other kind of complexity that, that concerns me is that ternary relations are not really easy to think about. Uh, Three-place relations 
Uh, mathematicians don't talk about them very much. Um, in general, they much prefer talking about binary operations. Binary operations, binary relations are everywhere. Ternary relations seem to be harder to find and harder to think about. But Urquhart's insight is that ternary relations occur very naturally in geometry. So here I've got this little bit of a space with a few points and a few lines. Uh, if we think of the relation of being on the same line as collinearity, this is essentially a ternary relation. You know, here in this little space that I've got, A, B, and C are on the same line. They're collinear, but A, B, and E are not collinear. They're not on the same line. Okay, this is a, a relation which does not collapse into a combination of binary relations. It's essentially a three place relation. And the betweenness relation or the surrounding relation, I call it surrounding at the moment because, and the way I want to write it is like this that A and C surround B. You know, on this line, A and C have got B between them. So A and C together surround B. Uh, if you generalize it into a space you might be interested in, you know, being surrounded by a bunch of points. Uh, here, A and C surround B, but A and B don't surround C. And again, this is essentially a, a three-place relation. And so this is a natural place to find three-place relations. Now, when you're thinking about what makes some geometry geometry, uh, this is going to be something that, we'll, that I want to uh, pay attention to a little bit later. The properly geometric properties of something are those that are, you know, preserved under geometric transformations like translation, rotation, or scaling. Uh, so, for example, geometric properties are things like being on the same line as, being between, uh, the property of having an intersection or being the intersection of something, uh, the property of being inside or outside, you know, angles, the kinds of stuff you learned in geometry when you did uh, high school. That sort of thing. Relative size, shape, being bigger than, smaller than, all of that stuff, they're geometric properties. Whereas the property of being here or the property of uh, being exactly this big, uh, those sorts of things aren't um, geometric properties. There, there are others. And similarly, you could take, select from the geometric properties the topological properties or the, the um, sky, um, you know, the cardinality properties. They're even stronger. Uh, criteria on being properties because the set of transformations that you're transforming things are between uh, are greater. But here the geometric properties are preserved under, you know, moving things around, uh, rotating the plane or the space or scaling, that sort of thing. Now, I, I say this because the fit between ternary relational models and uh, uh, geometry is really elegant and close, but it's not perfect. Okay. Uh, in particular, uh, the notion of an ordering is really useful. This partial ordering, this informational ordering on relevant uh, logics, models for relevant logics, is really useful for modeling some things. Uh, but it doesn't occur in most geometries. There, there's a sense in which if you think about, say, the real plane, you know, the two-dimensional uh, the, the two surface, that we draw diagrams on, that sort of thing. There's no natural ordering other than the identity, which is a, not, which is a trivial ordering. There's no natural non-trivial ordering other than identity in most of these geometric spaces. Um, oh, Tomas is just making a question there. Uh, I guess we assume that the space is affine for betweenness to make sense. Totally right. Uh, you know, so the, if you go back to um, here talking about collinearity and betweenness. Um, not saying that the concept of betweenness is a sensible concept in everything that people call a geometric space, but there are some things which are geometries where betweenness is definable. So Euclidean spaces, that sort of thing, we can make uh, sense of this. And whereas in projective spaces, uh, that betweenness is not uh, is is kind of trivial. Um, so. But if you think, oh, let me try and draw a diagram. That's what's fun about geometry is you get to draw lots of diagrams. Uh, if I think of, uh, you know, the, the two-dimensional plane, and you might think I might have this kind of natural ordering uh, between things where I might say that this, this uh, point occurs, uh, you know, above or under that point here. The, the problem with this is I could sort of rotate the whole plane around 180 degrees 
and transform them so that the two different points are in different positions and now they're uh, exactly the opposite points to each other and now uh, the ordering will say that the other is over the other and so this is not something which is preserved at least under that kind of rotation it is preserved on just the one dimensional line if you're thinking of the kinds of transformations as sliding things along the line where you can't actually take the line outside of itself and rotate it at 180 degrees or anything like that so there's a natural ordering on the one dimensional real line you know one natural natural um ordering a partial order relation uh in higher dimensional euclidean spaces uh there's got a consequence for this because uh in very natural spaces like euclidean spaces like standard two-dimensional three-dimensional four-dimensional geometry it'll turn out that there are no normal points uh which is a real pain if you think that normal points are where logic is meant to be true uh and most relevant logicians have wanted there to be normal points uh in their models uh that would be a real shame if there weren't any but you know if your space has got no natural ordering other than the identity ordering then to be a normal point you need this condition to be true that if x is applied to y and x is normal then uh the result of applying x to y has just got to be y can't be anything else but that's really that really sucks uh when it comes to standard geometries because if i've got a point x and i've got a point y and I apply them, and this is something like the collinearity relation, so I'm talking about being on the same line or some relation kind of like that, then if I go between X and Y, uh, then, well, in most, I mean, in most um, geometries, uh, lines have got more than two points. Okay, that's actually a condition in you know projective geometry. So there's gonna be some other point on the line as well, which isn't gonna be X and isn't gonna be Y. And so there's going to be no point in this space which counts as a normal point okay, if you've got the collinearity condition for application. So um, what um, Urquhart did when he tried to invent, um, when he tried to invent uh, models of relevant logics out of these geometries, he would need to glue an extra point on to be a normal point, which isn't really a point which uh, is one of the standard points in the space. Okay. So that's his approach, add an extra point. And this is a wonderful and venerable tradition in mathematics of, you know, idealizing, saying, okay, we want a solution to the, an equation. There was no solution to this equation. There was nothing doing this job. So I'll add, add this abstract extra thing. You know, that's how we got the square root of minus one. You know, that's how we got pi. That's how we got a whole bunch of other things. So next section. The other sections I promise will be shorter. <sighs> When we think about the, the way of adding extra points and the way of um, making models out of these constructions, uh, it's turned out in our thinking about this to try and understand the complexity of models for uh, relevant logics in a slightly new way. Okay. Uh, and this is, this is my joint work with Sean on collection frames. One of the complaints that I had about models of relevant logic is that they have these three different concepts that are kind of tied to loosely tied to each other. The three place combination thing, the ordering of information and this collection of normal points. I've written them in this funny way uh, with these underlines and overlines to point out a kind of logical connection between the behavior of the variables there that have got a line under them and a variable that has got a line over them. The position of an underlined variable is closed downward under the informational ordering. What that means is, in particular, this x here, if I pick anything lower than x, it's also going to satisfy this condition. And this x here, if I pick anything lower than x in the, in the condition, in the ordering, it's also going to satisfy this condition. Whereas the overlined variables are the things that are closed upward. You know, this says that if you've got a normal point and if you've got something which is larger than a normal point, it's also going to be normal. So normality in this uh, model is a condition which is, you know, if, if a point is normal, then any 
greater point in the order which carries all that information and more is still going to satisfy the normality condition. And so the upwards things uh, uh, highlight, highlight there, and they're all actually just the variables there. Now, um, if you rewrite these things, so we sort of segregate uh, the things that are preserved downwards and the things that are preserved upwards with the relation thing between them, uh, you get this. You get, uh, you know, uh, Z is related, by, uh, Z is a normal point or X is under Z or X and Y combined give you Z, which is a natural way of thinking about these three different concepts. Well, in this work that Sean and I have been doing on collection frames, uh, we've come to the conclusion that these aren't three different concepts. They're the one concept described three different ways. Um, so instead of thinking about them as uh, one uh, relate, one thing and another thing order and another thing R, it's R is a multi-airy uh, concept, a way of combining stuff together to get a result. And it just depends how much stuff you're combining together. In the first case, we're combining nothing, the empty collection of things together to get Z. In the next case, we're just combining Z X by itself, the singleton combination. And here we've got the binary combination to get Z. In general, what we've got is a collection of things, which a finite collection of things, uh, a finite collection of points, and you combine them together to get this other point or where the, the result is a possible result of combining together the, the things that were in X. So if I've got a finite collection of elements from P, then uh, Z is another element from P and a collection relation is something that relates the one to the other. Now, what kind of finite collection might you be collecting? In general, it could be a leaf label tree, which is just an, an arbitrary non-associative combination of things, or it could be a list if you want to respect order, or it could be a multi-set if you don't care about order but care about multiplicity, or it could be a set if you don't care about order or multiplicity. A whole bunch of different things that you could do. In the models of the relevant logic R, we don't care about order, we don't care about associativity, and we don't care about multiplicity, so we're going to focus on sets. And so we're going to think of a collection relation as relating a finite set of points to a point. And this generalizes the ordering. The ordering here is just the case of a singleton related to something. Uh, remember the normal points will be found by looking at an empty set related to something. And the, uh, the ternary relation is when you combine a pair for something. And then, you know, the higher combinations are just done by nesting the, the ternary relation R. Now, because R generalizes the, um, binary or uh, the partial order thing, it is natural for it to satisfy analogs of reflexivity and transitivity. And the things that Sean and I have come up with are very simple. The analog of reflexivity is kind of obvious. A singleton X is related to X. The analog of transitivity is more complicated. Uh, transitivity, well, if, I'm com if I have a collection which is related to a, a single thing X, and I then combine X with something. In this case, combination is just adding a singleton to a set. If I combine X and uh, Y together to make a uh, little Y, then presumably I can combine X and Y uh, to make Y. That's just chaining the combination relation R. That's uh, one version of transitivity. And it turns out that we need a kind of converse of this, which says that if X union Y is related to something, then we could, you know, first have processed the X into some representative, call it little X, combine that with Y to get Y. And so then that's the kind of converse that we need. And it turns out that that notion of transitivity uh, is going to be enough uh, to generate all of the other conditions uh, that we have in a ternary relational semantics. So to picture it, this is what I was thinking about when I was waving my hands about, the left to right thing is this, if I have X and it combines together to give you this little X as a representative, and then I combine this X and Y together to get this little Y as a representative, then instead I could have just combined the X and Y together to get the, the Y. 
And the reverse goes like this. If the X and the Y together give you the Y, then you could focus on the X bit first, find some representative for that, which then you combine with the Y to give you the little Y. That's just a notion of a, a collection, a collection relation. Actually, the, the word that we give for that is it's compositional. So it's a compositionality uh, because you can see it as kind of we're analyze, we're processing the X and Y together to give us a Y and we can do that bit by bit. Or if I'm doing this bit by bit, I can chain them together. The details you can read later. But what that means is that you can uh, get this whole complicated ternary relational business like this, ternary relational frames for positive R and get those clauses. And then when you look at it under that lens, what you need is this. A compositional set frame for R is a set of points and this relation, which is a relation between finite sets of points and points, which is compositional. And that's it. Okay. And that's all you need. Uh, that's a, a model for R plus. And so the stuff about normal points, the stuff about ordering, the stuff about the ternary relation is all encoded in the one thing uh, like that. The normal points are the things which are related to the empty collection. The ordering is just the relation between a singleton collection and the binary relation uh, that we know and love is just the ordering between a pair, uh, a, a pair, pair set. Okay, why did I go through all of that? Because it gives us a very general and quick way of understanding what goes on with the adding a point at infinity in this construction that, that Alistair did. Because it gives us a really natural way of thinking about what the hell is going on in points where we don't have normal, in models where we don't have normal points. You see, when I think about the, the history and the development of relevant logics, uh, you could have imagined an alternate history where it was very different, where we didn't start thinking about Hilbert systems and axioms and uh, trying to axiomatize what the logical truths were. If we'd focused just on doing natural deduction or something like that, where we never cared about what happens when you discharge all of your assumptions, then we could have just been thinking about the relevant connections between premises and conclusions and never thought about what, what are the things which are actually true. You could have just had your models and we could have said, well, something's valid if at every point where the premises are true, the conclusion's true in our models and never thought that that had to be respected by a particular place where that conditional was true. So you could have had models with no normal points. We just never thought of it like that. Uh, but how do you do that? Naturally keeping the stuff that you want about the, 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 uh, the ordering and the binary relation and all of that stuff and delete the normal points. Well, in a compositional set frame, you can do that. The very easy thing you do is you do everything that you had before, except you just say that the collections can't be empty and you leave all of the other conditions exactly the same. And it's a very natural kind of beast. Uh, the ordering is still there the binary relation is still uh, the, the the binary combination the ternary relation is still there and these are models for r where we just don't have a little we can't model little t the true thing you can't discharge all your premises in a natural deduction thing you can't have an empty left hand side in a sequent proof uh and so you can do this and this is really sweet because now that is the, the geometries are just models of this notion so take the surrounding relation in say uh, two-dimensional real, real space. Uh, makes perfect sense to say when uh, it is that X and Y surround Z. You know, we, I mean, X and Y surround V. Here's X, here's Y. Uh, what are the things that it surrounds? Hmm. We have lost the connection to my screen. Can you still hear me? Yes, we have lost the connection uh, thank you. Uh, but you've lost the connection to the board. Let me, mm, bah, bah, bah. okay. This is the point at which we go into debugging. Uh, you can see the screen, but you can't see, uh, the diagram that I have drawn and I'm on the next slide to what you can see. You can still see compositional set frames for non-normal R, can't you? 
you can see a mouse moving. That's interesting. Um, okay, that means it's lost the connection. Let me go back to here. Ba -ba, turn it off. And now go back and share. Aha, I see what happened. Yeah. Can you see it now? Is there a diagram? That's good. Now it's changed the size of the thing on my screen. Must see if the Wi Fi connection between my iPad and my computer cuts out. That's what it is. Now, unfortunately, I'm doing some horrible debugging. Okay. So, so the surrounding relation. Uh, if take just a two dimensional plane of standard geometric plane reasoning. And I got a lot uh, the points X and Y, I want to know which are different. Uh, I want to know what are the points that X and Y surround, they're going to be all of the points here in between. Uh, and not any of the points elsewhere on the line, let alone anywhere else. Makes perfect sense. Uh, what are the points that X, Y, and Z surround? Well, it's kind of the natural thing to think is I draw the triangle between X, Y, and Z, and it's going to be all of these things uh, that are in between them. And the neat thing about this is that that is actually satisfying all the conditions for being compositional that I said. Uh, what that actually means, if you step through the definitions, is that, uh, for example, I can find, say I want to check whether X, Y, and Z surround this point. Well, there needs to be some point where X and Y surround, and if I choose it carefully, it'll be this guy, and uh, call that U, and then Z and U surround uh, this guy which is kind of sweet. And I could have done it this way too, and this way too, this is, dang, uh, I'm not good at drawing lines. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, larger thing, take four points, the things that they surround is gonna be this, all of the things that are in there. And this satisfies the conditions for being a comp compositional relation. Uh, it's a very natural sort of thing to, to depict. Uh, but we should check a couple of things. We should check uh, what does X by itself surround? Uh, well the only thing which is consistent with all of our definitions is that the only thing that X surrounds is X itself. And that satisfies all the conditions that we want. It all works, uh, counts as one of these relations. And the thing that you notice is that it makes no sense to say, uh, what is it that the empty set surrounds? You could kind of say that the empty set surrounds nothing, uh, but then that's not going to satisfy the compositionality requirements uh, for a collection relation because the empty set is a subset of any set and you could uh, take that out and need to find its representative. So this is not going to work. So this is going to be a model of uh, one of these models of relevant logic where you don't have any normal points, where you don't have any point which is related to the empty set because the empty set can't be related to anything. And so if we want the empty set to be related to something, we need to affix one of these ideal points. But I want to stop for a bit and think that there's something really sweet about this sort of way of conceptualizing uh, the relevant semantics. Because if you just think of an abstract space, and we're thinking of these points and we're kind of combining them together, uh, Z and W, and these sort of bound a region of conceptual space and the things that are somehow relevantly connected to that are the things which are you know, inside that region. And so in general, if I'm wanting to take the information that's in some point, if I want to take the information that's in some point and figure out whether it carries the information that a conditional is true, then I look at any point which validates the antecedent and then I'm combining those points in a way which doesn't generate everything, doesn't generate nothing. It, the, 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 the sort of conceptual space which is bound by that combination is connected to them in that kind of very graphic uh, uh, way. 
it's not just the stuff that's in X, it's not just the stuff in uh, A, but it's uh, connected to it in this sort of way. So it's, it's, it's at least nice for drawing diagrams and nice for giving you a possible way of thinking about relevant connection. So that's kind of sweet. But then when you do the adding a point at infinity thing, uh, it turns out in the very general abstract setting of collection frames, there's natural way of thinking about this. In fact, there's two natural ways of thinking about this, which have got very different properties. One of them is how Alistair does it in his papers and the other is not. Uh, so the, the topic is this, we've got this uh, relation, which is just relating non-empty finite sets of points to points. And we wanna add a point at infinity, which means we're extending R to a new relation where this point at infinity is the target of the empty set. And in general, this new relation is now going to be relating finite sets, empty or otherwise, of points where infinity is a new one of these points. So we're adding this to our, you know, geometry, Ge abstract geometry as it were and now we're wanting to extend the relation so that it can talk about this new point in such a way that we're relating any finite collection of sets and we're saying hey here's a here's a finite set here's a finite set of points uh what's what's one of your representatives what's tell us which are your representatives there in the space turns out there's two natural options for doing this very easy dumb excellent blunt instrument way of doing this is this. This is what I'll call R plus. R plus uh, relates set of points to a point. When here's what you do, you take infinity out of, of this set X if it was there and check and check the old relation and say what it was related to. Okay. Or everything gets to be related to the, the, the new point. So that way the empty set gets related to the new point. Everything gets related to the new point. Turns out that this does satisfy the condition of being uh, a compositional relation. It works. Uh, it's the easiest, dumbest way of, of adding a point at infinity. It's got this really sweet property that the point at infinity is above everything, which if you think about infinity, seems like a decent place for it to be in the ordering. But what that means logically is that anything which is true at any of our points is true at the point at infinity, which is not what people tend to think of when you're thinking of uh, logics which have got something like negation in, okay? Unless you're a trivialist and you want there to be a point where everything is true, which is totally fine, but it's kind of odd that that's the normal point where logic is true, okay? And that's the only normal point where logic is true. Kind of weird, but you can do it and it works. But another thing that you could do, uh, which is how Alistair sort of does it in his models, if you think about it in this lens, is what I call R times or Rx. And this uh, is much more conservative when it talks about point, adding the point at infinity. So if I want to know whether a set is related to, Z, uh, related to a new point or an old point, I take infinity out of this and I check what it was related to. And they're the only things that this is related to if there's some of the old, old style points in this set X. So if this set contains something other than infinity, if X contains something other than infinity, the only things it relates to are the things that it would have related to if in the original model. It's very conservative. It's not, it's not saying that this infinity point is related to that. And otherwise, this thing is related to infinity in the case where this, point, this set X that I chose without infinity is empty, which means either it's the empty set or, or, or it's the infinity uh, singleton in this case. So X uh, relates to this ideal point only when X is one of these things. So it turns out that this infinity point is now not gonna dominate everything. In fact, uh, nothing is under it except for itself. So it's very different in the ordering. And that's kind of more natural in one sense for being a normal point, at least if you've got relevant intuitions. Thing is, you can't do this if your model is something like a model of intuitionist logic, uh, because this induces failures of weakening. It makes it kind of relevant to do this. So, but a whole bunch of hacking shows you that uh, both of these relations are compositional if the original relation is on the old space. 
So it's a general way of converting a model without a normal point into a model with a normal point. So that's one result, which kind of generalizes uh, what, what Alistair has done in a sweet sort of way. Last thing, here's a negative result, uh, or maybe it's positive, I'm not sure. You can tell me. Here's some desiderata for geometric relations in various spaces. You know, the idea that I had before that the, the surrounding relation, which uh, just, you know, the, the points that something surrounds, you draw the shape and look at the shape that's, uh, uh, that that defines. The surrounding relation relates, you know, X, Y, Z, and W to all of those things which are inside that space. This makes sense in any Euclidean space. Uh, call that in general, if X is a finite set, we'll call uh, B of X, the shape which is bounded by, uh, by, sorry, that should be bounded by X, the shape which is bounded by X. We'll call the relation R an inclusive relation if the only things that X relates to are inside here. It doesn't relate things to R, things which are outside that space, okay? Uh, that's what it is for R to be inclusive. Uh, so um, the surrounds relation is the biggest inclusive relation. That's a nice thing, I think. It's I mean, not all compositional relations are going to be inclusive. The collinearity relation isn't, for example. Um, we'll call a relation regional if what a set relates to is just defined by the region that it bounds. So the idea here is if, say, I'm doing just something along the line. So imagine here and I've got X and Y, and I wanna know what X and Y relate to. And here I've got X and Y and Z, and I wanna know what X and Y and Z relate to. I shouldn't have used Z over here, should I? The answers to these are gonna be the same. Okay, if the relation is regional, if you know we just think of X, Y, and Z as determining a shape, and then we're asking what are the things which are related to that shape? That's what it is for a relation to be regional. And some compositional relations, like the surrounds relation, like the collinearity relation, like the, for example, um, mid on the line, the midpoint relation, which of a of an interval selects its midpoint, that's regional. And we'll say that a relation is preserved if uh, it's preserved under geometric transformations. So if I shifted everything along one on the line or translated it on the plane or rotated it on the two-dimensional plane or something like that, the result would still hold. That's what it is for uh, a relation to be re preserved. And harking back to Alistair's original paper, we'll say that a relation is functional if the, uh, every non-empty set is uh, related to just a unique thing, okay? So every collection of things has got a unique representative, a point which encodes the information of those things taken together. That's Alistair's original thing. Well, it turns out, and this is a theorem which I'm in view of time, not gonna prove for you, but we can go through in the Q and A if you're really, really curious. It turns out that on the real line, there's exactly two relations which satisfy these four criteria. Can anybody guess what they are? I'm not going to give you time to guess. Uh, they're min and max. You know, take your interval, take the first bit. That turns out to be inclusive. It's in the interval. It's preserved under transformations. Move the interval. The min and the max is the same. It's regional. Uh, take the min and the max of three things. It's the same as the min and max of the outliers of the, the thing, etc. And it's functional. It's only one thing. Okay. So it... There's exactly two relations that satisfy these desiderata on R. Min and max do. There's a lovely little geometric argument to show you that nothing else can, which is kind of sweet. Uh, and if you go above two, two dimensions, there's going to be no other relations that satisfy the desiderata. In particular, because the real line is inside any higher space. And if I uh, have a space, for example, if I had this relation that I thought was going to work, which was min or max, for example, let's just choose min as, uh, so, 
and just restrict my attention to a line inside it. The restriction of the relation to that has got to either be min or either be either be min or max. Choose which one it is. Let's suppose it's min, uh, and then the relation applied to one and two will give us one as the winner, the representative of the interval. And then, uh, well, I can just rotate this 180 degrees. And now uh, the result of applying uh, min and max is going to not be the rotated version of this, which will be over here, but it's going to be this guy. So the 180 degrees rotation of min is max, uh, which is not min. Okay. And so that's one argument that can show you that there's nothing that you can choose because the restriction of a relation onto this thing has or got to be either min or max and it's not preserved under rotation. So uh, there's no relations that satisfy the desiderata in these higher spaces. Okay, that's a little theorem. So what the hell does all of this mean? Well, in thinking about this, it's been kind of sweet to see that you can use Alistair's uh, original insights into the connection between geometries and models of relevant logics, but also extend them to provide new ways to build and understand uh, these sorts of models. So that's it. Thank you.